in the vast skies of World War II, one aircraft soared above the rest, a colossus of engineering that redefined the art of aerial warfare. The Boeing B-29 Superfortress was not merely a bomber, it was a technological marvel that carried the weight of history on its broad wings. Capable of flying higher, faster, and farther than any bomber of its time, it delivered devastating blows to the heart of the Japanese Empire, culminating in missions that altered the course of humanity. With its sleek, silver fuselage and four roaring engines, the B-29 was a sight to behold, a symbol of American ingenuity and resolve. And if you were a crew member, you might have appreciated the pressurized cabin that let you sip coffee at 30,000 feet without an oxygen mask. Quite the upgrade from the chilly, open cockpits of earlier bombers. To understand how this behemoth took flight, we must travel back to the late 1930s, a time when the world teetered on the brink of global conflict. The United States Army Air Corps, sensing the need for a new kind of bomber, issued a call in January 1940 for a very heavy bomber capable of striking targets thousands of miles away. Boeing, already renowned for its B-17 Flying Fortress, stepped up with an ambitious proposal. Led by Chief Engineer Edmund T. Allen, Boeing's team envisioned an aircraft that could carry massive payloads over vast distances, operate at altitudes beyond the reach of most enemy fighters, and incorporate cutting-edge technology. The result was the B-29, a project so bold it pushed the boundaries of what was possible. But ambition came with challenges. Building a bomber this advanced was like trying to invent the future while racing against the clock of war. Funding was tight, and the Army Air Corps wasn't entirely convinced Boeing could deliver on such lofty promises. Hopefully, they had a good accountant to keep the budget from crashing before the plane did. Development began in earnest in 1939 at Boeing's facilities in Seattle, Washington. The Army Air Corps had specified a bomber with a range of over 3,000 miles, a bomb load of up to 20,000 pounds, and the ability to fly at altitudes above 30,000 feet. Boeing's engineers faced a daunting task. No aircraft of this scale had ever been built. The B-29's design required innovations in aerodynamics, propulsion, and crew accommodations. Early concepts included a high aspect ratio wing for better lift and efficiency, a semi-monocoque fuselage for strength, and a tricycle landing gear system to handle the aircraft's massive weight. By 1940, Boeing had secured a contract to build two prototypes, designated XB-29. But the project was a gamble. The Army ordered quantity production before the first prototype even flew, a risky move that underscored the urgency of the war effort. In 1941, as the United States entered World War II, the pressure intensified. Engineers worked around the clock, but setbacks were inevitable. Early engine designs overheated, and the complex fire control system baffled even the sharpest minds. It was as if the B-29 was reminding everyone that building a giant wasn't as easy as stacking blueprints. The first XB-29 prototype took to the skies on September 21, 1942. From Boeing Field in Seattle, piloted by test pilot Edmund T. Allen, the flight was a milestone, but it revealed issues that would plague the B-29's development. The Wright R-3350 duplex cyclone engines, each delivering 2,200 horsepower, were prone to overheating, a serious problem at high altitudes. Cooling systems struggled to keep up, and test pilots reported handling quirks due to the aircraft's size and weight. Despite these challenges, the Army Air Forces pushed forward, establishing the B-29 program as a top priority. By 1943, production models began rolling off assembly lines in Wichita, Kansas, Renton, Washington, and Omaha, Nebraska, where the Martin Company also built B-29s. The second prototype, flown in early 1943, showed improvements, but engine fires and electrical glitches persisted. Boeing's team, led by engineers like Walter T. Fish, worked tirelessly to refine the design, ensuring the B-29 would meet the Army's demanding specifications. By late 1943, the B-29 was ready for combat trials, but the road to operational success was bumpy. The aircraft's complexity required extensive training for crews, and maintenance issues were frequent. The Army Air Forces established the 20th Air Force under the command of General Curtis E. LeMay to oversee B-29 operations in the Pacific. The first combat missions 
launched from bases in India and China in June 1944, targeted Japanese-held territories in Southeast Asia. These early raids exposed logistical challenges. Supply lines across the Himalayas were treacherous, and engine reliability remained a concern. Hopefully, the ground crews had plenty of spare parts and patience to keep those engines humming. The B-29's design was a triumph of engineering, a blend of power and innovation that set it apart from its contemporaries. Its fuselage, constructed from lightweight aluminum, was a semi-monocoque structure, meaning it relied on both its skin and internal framework for strength. The aircraft measured 99 feet in length, with a wingspan of 141 feet 3 inches and a height of 27 feet 9 inches. Its four right R3350 duplex cyclone engines, each producing 2,200 horsepower, drove massive four-blade propellers, giving the B-29 a top speed of 360 miles per hour and a cruising speed of 280 miles per hour. The aircraft's empty weight was 74,500 pounds, with a maximum takeoff weight of 133,500 pounds. Hopefully, the crew had strong stomachs to handle the vibrations at high altitudes. One of the B-29's most revolutionary features was its pressurized cabins, a first for a combat aircraft. The forward and aft compartments, connected by a pressurized tube over the bomb bays, allowed the 11-man crew to operate at altitudes up to 31,850 feet without oxygen masks. The tail gunner's position, however, was isolated, accessible only at lower altitudes, which made high-altitude emergencies a bit of a logistical puzzle. The B-29 boasted a central fire control system, an analog computer that enabled one gunner to control four remote turrets, each armed with two caliber machine guns. A tail turret, manned directly, carried two caliber machine guns and a 20 millimeter cannon in early models, later replaced with a third machine gun for reliability. The aircraft could carry up to 20,000 pounds of bombs in two large bomb bays, a payload unmatched by any other bomber of the era. Its tricycle landing gear with dual wheels supported its massive weight on the ground. Landing this beast was no small feat. Pilots needed nerves of steel and a steady hand to keep it from wobbling like a giant silver bird learning to walk. The B-29's operational history is a saga of triumph and tragedy in the Pacific theater. By early 1944, B-29s were deployed to the Mariana Islands, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam where airfields carved from coral and jungle became their launching pads. Under General Curtis E. LeMay's command, the 20th Air Force conducted high-altitude precision raids against Japanese industrial targets, but early results were mixed due to jet streams and engine issues. LeMay shifted tactics in 1945, ordering low-altitude incendiary raids. On March 9, 1945, 334 B-29s firebombed Tokyo, dropping thousands of M69 incendiary bombs that leveled 16 square miles and devastated the city. These raids, repeated across Japan, crippled its war machine. The most historic missions came in August 1945. On August 6, the Enola Gay, piloted by Colonel Paul W. Tibbetts Jr., dropped the first atomic bomb, Little Boy, on Hiroshima from Tinian's North Field. Three days later, on August 9, Boxcar, piloted by Major Charles W. Sweeney, dropped Fat Man on Nagasaki. These missions, flown at great risk, hastened Japan's surrender on August 15, 1945. Hopefully, the crews found a moment to process the weight of those missions, for they reshaped the world in ways no one could have imagined. Beyond its bombing role, the B-29 proved versatile. It laid naval mines in Japanese waters, disrupting shipping lanes and conducted photographic reconnaissance missions. Crews faced grueling conditions, missions often lasted 15 hours, and engine fires were a constant threat. One B-29, named Keybird, crash-landed on Greenland's ice cap in 1947 during a Cold War mission, its crew surviving a harrowing rescue. Another, piloted by Captain Robert M. Morgan in the Memphis Bell's sister ship, Lady Be Good, completed a daring low-level raid on Nagoya in 1945, earning Morgan the Distinguished Flying Cross. The B-29's crews, trained at bases like Smoky Hill Army Airfield in Salina, Kansas, became tight-knit families, relying on each other to navigate the perils of Pacific skies. If you think flying a 15-hour mission sounds exhausting, 
try doing it with the constant worry of an engine catching fire mid-flight. The B-29's legacy extends far beyond World War II. During the Korean War, from 1950 to 1953, B-29s flew thousands of missions against North Korean and Chinese forces, facing new threats like MiG-15 jet fighters and advanced anti-aircraft guns. The aircraft adapted to roles beyond bombing, including weather reconnaissance as the WB-29 and aerial refueling as the KB-29. In 1947, a B-29 served as the mothership for the Bell X-1, piloted by Captain Charles E. Yeager, which broke the sound barrier on October 14 at Muroc Army Airfield, California. By the mid-1950s, the B-29 was phased out, replaced by the B-50 Superfortress, an upgraded variant with improved engines and systems. Today, only 22 B-29s survive, with two airworthy examples, Doc and Fifi, maintained by organizations like the Commemorative Air Force. The Enola Gay, displayed at the National Air and Space Museum's Stephen F. Udvar Hayes Center in Chantilly, Virginia, remains a sobering reminder of its role in history. If you ever get the chance to see one, you'll understand why they called it the Super Fortress. It's a towering testament to aviation's past, still inspiring awe in anyone who loves the roar of a radial engine. The Boeing B-29 Super Fortress was a game-changer, a technological titan that carried the weight of history on its wings. Its story is one of innovation, courage, and monumental impact. From the drawing boards of Seattle to the skies over Tokyo, it bridged the gap between the propeller age and the jet era, paving the way for modern aviation. Hopefully, this journey through its history gives you a sense of just how extraordinary this aircraft was, a true giant that still casts a long shadow over the skies today.